Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 55, Take a Shot, Tips for Running Public Play One-Shot RPG. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and as always, live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and continue on even after the double bell for the Off the Books After Show. For those of you who aren't here live, you can listen in on that After Show audio by joining our Patreon. As a thanks for supporting us, you also get other cool stuff like access to our private Discord channel where you can chat with us and other fans of the show, pre-production show notes, behind-the-scene blog posts, and more. Um, so today is our first big RPG topic in quite some time or possibly ever. I was trying to remember if we'd done a full episode on RPGs before. I know we've talked about them a lot when we have con recaps, but tonight we have an RPG related question and we're going to have an RPG related Ask the Bellhop segment. Um, after that though, I'm going to have some initial thoughts on Power of Madness, which I know a lot of people are curious about. Uh, I had some additional plays of King of the Dice, this time with adults, and I got Lotus back to the table. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some of the feedback we received, comments on our content, maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Up first, a comment on one of our older posts talking about two-player games great for date night. Kathy writes, Lost Cities for sure. We also love Wingspan, Sagrada, Carcassonne the City, Zolkin, and Homesteaders. Well, thanks, Cassie. Great list of games there, though it seems like you might like a heavier date night with Zolkin and Homesteader. Uh, next, we have some comments on our Zentico, uh, Zentico review and giveaway. Leo Pang writes... Uh, it seems like Alquerque. I I had to look that one up. Alquerque or Alquerque. I'm not quite sure how that's pronounced. Um, there is a Wikipedia page for it. If you Google it, it's A-L-Q-U-E-R-Q-U-E. -E. Um, it does look actually very similar. I actually at first thought the boards were identical, but then I noticed not every dot on the board is connected through lines. But the big difference is that Alquerque is more like checkers. It's where you have half most of the board filled except the central spot and you have to jump each other and there's no capturing in Zentico. So there's no jumping. There's nothing like that. You can always slide your pieces between slots and all players always have four pieces on the board at all times. Alessandra Bertucci said this about Zentico. Two comments. One great review. Love to win the copy, but since I don't use Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, I can hear the gas from here. I couldn't get many checks, but that's okay. I'll still keep an eye for this game. Two reminds me of Abalone. Well, thanks, Alessandro. No reason to apologize for not using social media. I, I wish I used less of it myself these days, though I don't know if I could completely wean myself off the drip. Now, Abalone, Abalone is another game where you are jumping and capturing opponents' pieces. Again, that's not something that's part of Zentico. Now, Matt Sanders had a comment about last week's topic, top gateway games to come out in the last three years. A very good list. I use Azul as a gateway game, along with Flame Rouge. Uh, thanks for the comment, Matt. I've yet to try uh, Flame Rouge at all. I've heard really good things about it, but it's just one I haven't had a chance to pick up, and I don't know anyone local that owns it. Now, I would be interested in trying it. If anyone's got a copy, if you could bring that out to one of our local events, I would love to give that bicycle racing game a try. One more comment on last week's topic. Carrie Deslip writes, this is a great list. There's some, gr sorry, this is a great list. There's some games I already own and some that have piqued my interest. Thanks, Bellhop. Well, you're welcome, Carrie. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. 
We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop One Word. Now, the best way for questions to come through is through the website. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today's topic comes from Nate Parker, who tweeted to ask, I was hoping you could twist your arm, I could twist your arm into doing a write-up or podcast episode covering how to run a good RPG session for a gaming event, con, public event, etc. I feel like it is different from regular sessions you have you have with known players, and I would love to hear some experienced people talk about it. Well, thanks for the topic, Nate. Um, we got you both ways. So if you head over to the blog, you can already read an article, and we're going to discuss that here tonight. So we got you on the blog and on the podcast. I got to say, I'm glad to see some role-playing questions showing up now and then. Uh, I've said it many times on the show. I say it way more often on social media. To me, tabletop means any game where I sit down with friends and play together. And that very much includes RPGs, even those played over a virtual tabletop and through modern technology like Skype. Though that's not what today's topic is about, we're definitely talking about playing in person. Yeah. Now, I'm pretty rusty on RPG in general, and I've never really sought out the role of GM. But I have to say, one-off con games are what I have the most recent experiences with as a player. Now, personally, I've got a lot of experience both ways, uh, both running and playing public play role playing games. Uh, this includes weekly game nights at the local game store, the friendly local game store. I uh, used organized events for Dungeons and Dragons. I was a Herald level DM for RPGA through Dungeons and Dragons back when you used to have to like, take a test to run public events. Um, I've also run, played many games. Uh, I've also campaign games, both at home and at local game stores. Now, over the years, I've learned that there is a significant, I would say, major difference between running a long-term campaign and running a one-shot. They are two totally different things. Uh, and by one-shot, I mean a single session or even sort session where you're just playing one or two. Uh, the focus, the tone, and the pacing are all completely different. Now, player expectations are also different. And that includes the DM as a player. I don't just mean the players versus the DM. I mean everyone at the table. I would go so far as to say that they're really completely different beasts. Like you're almost running a different game. Now, some game moderators prefer one style over the other. I know some that only run one style of game and others who do both one shots and campaigns. The GM needs to have a level of comfort with whichever format that you're choosing to run. Players new or experienced can feel the discomfort of a GM who's out of their element, and that can impact the game. Now, public play, that is uh, Pandora's box, right? That's a whole new set of difficulties, but also opportunities. Uh, playing at home can be very different from playing at a public venue and playing with strangers. While I personally love public play and have run a ton of games in public over the years, there are some things that you have to consider when running this way. Now, today, we're going to discuss some tips that I've learned over the many years I've been running games to make the most out of running a one-shot or an event game in public, whether that's at your local game store, or at a con, at a comic con, or just anywhere you may be playing with strangers. Now, the best advice I'd ever heard, this is my number one thing when running any type of one-shot game, and this applies to both playing in public or if you're just playing with your home group, is get to the action right away. Um, there's a term I use, but it's that I'm stealing from the misdirected mark guys, but it would require Sean dinging it out. I would just say, get to the monkey. There's another word in there. Don't waste time. Don't waste time on the background or the setup or explaining your awesome game world. Just dive right into the action. You should never waste time with things like shopping, chatting with NPCs that don't matter, travel time or basically anything else that is not actual action that pushes the story forward. Now, while in your home game, the number of torches and rations you have, the weight distribution of your gear on horses may matter intensely, but you are mm -hmm. time constrained in a public play setting. Micromanaging details is not what this is about. Exactly. Uh, the only time you do want to do that, if you're tracking rations, 
this better be a game where you're going to start if you run out. You better be playing Dark Sun when you're on your last wineskin of water. And if you're counting torches, it might best be because a dragon's going to show up when the last one runs out. You're not just tracking equipment. Heck, most public play games I play, you don't even have an equipment list. It's more about what your characters have on them. Now, I'm not just talking about starting the game in media res. I'm sure everyone who's ever run a game, read any article on gaming advice, is going to hear about the first section start in media res. Yes, that is one way to talk about getting to the action right away. But I'm not just talking about that first scene. Yes, start in media res. It's awesome. But this applies to every scene, every action taken. If the action that's about to happen isn't inciting and doesn't add to the story, skip it. If what matters is what behind the what's behind the door, start the action with the door opening, not listening at the door and checking for traps. The door opens and you find. If you're running a dungeon, the adventure should start at the opening of the dungeon, at a minimum. If there's actually nothing at the ocean, the opening of the dungeon until room three, start the action in room three. Start the game right then. Later on, if there's a series of empty rooms, do a montage describing the group going through room after room, finding nothing but old bits of rusted metal, dust, and rotted over everything that's not important to the current story. Everything that happens should matter and have an impact on the story and the game. Now, that's not just to suggest that action is the only way to have an impact, of course. There are mm -hmm. many ways to affect a character's life and advance a story, and choice of genres certainly impacts that as well. Yeah, now, I, I totally agree. I, don't, I can't think of a thing to even add to that. But yeah, I'm, I'm talking about making it action, but it's, it's not just action, advancing the story. Something has to change in the game world. Something has to be impacted. Now, the second best I've ever, advice I've ever received about running a one-shop RPG section the session that's actually, to be honest, possibly just as important as getting to the monkey but it applies equally to public play and playing at home, is remember, uh, this is something I've only ever heard in the last year from a variety of podcasts. Again, credit to the Misdirect and Mark Crew and the GEM team for, for getting this one stuck in my head, is that remember that this game is about the biggest day in the character's life. Because the thing is, with a single session role-playing game, this is their one and done. You show up, you play, you go home. You only get one chance to wow the players. No one is going to go home excited and talking about the game they had where they explored the dungeon and went through three rooms and found 50 gold. The game has to be as exciting and engaging as possible, and that starts with the story and plot. A one-shot needs to be the window into the most important day of your characters' lives. Now, and I think it's important, Mo, uh, what Mo said there is characters plural. You mm -hmm. need to have the right number of players at the table for your story shoehorn in extra ones because they're a friend and you could be allowing one of the players who paid to be there perhaps to not feel as important as they should during an event yeah you always have to share the spotlight now you could always run a one shot where the players go into the dungeon and steal the the shiny MacGuffin. great how like how many one i played many con games so they're just that and you know what they work like they're a game they're enjoyable but how much cooler would it be that you snuck into the dungeon and killed a damn dragon what if you killed Tiamat? Why tell the story about disrupting the orc supply lines when you can tell the story of how a small band of heroes defeats the orc warlord? You don't want to run the Star Wars game where you negotiate with the smugglers to get some new X-Wings. You want to blow up the damn Death Star. You are running a teenage angst-based game, you know, a Monster Hearts or um, Young Justice-style game. It better be Homecoming or Prom Night during that game. You're running a Shadow Run. You better not be just stealing something from as technology. How about instead assassinate the CEO? Like right now, it's time for the battle of far of armies, not meeting the ends for the first time. Yeah, think about superheroes. Uh, they hopefully spend most of their days patrolling and hoping nothing will happen. Uh, no one wants to spend money and take the time out of a, of a con only to play a superhero getting the ketchup stains off their <laughs> cape at the dry cleaner after stopping a, a runaway hot dog cart. <laughs> Cute. Very true. Now, another thing with one shots is the one shots one and done. There's no long term effect. You're not going to ruin your campaign or mess with the world. This is your chance to break the rules. This is where you can toss cannon out of the out, out of the game completely. This is where you can literally destroy a setting. 
like not only threaten the norm, but like destroy it, like blow up the forgotten realms. It's time for an apocalypse. Have Ragnarok happen. Have the fall of civilization happen. This is time for that once in a lifetime heist, the score to end all scores, the last job before you retire. It's your last day on the force. It's the day you were recruited by the MIB. It's that event that brings you back out of retirement. Remember, it's the most important day in your characters' lives. Not only story rules, but game rules as well. Now don't throw them out the window, but don't let yourself or your players get bogged down on minute details either. Dice rules don't matter as much as story and engagement for that short block of time you have your players. Yeah, it's got to be the big bang. That's it's it's the wow factor. No one's going to be talking about the game where you rolled a bunch of threes and you got stuck in the hallway and the orcs heard us and then we got ambushed and like get things moving, get the plot going, have important things happen and have the results be something dramatic. Now, my next tip is about getting players invested. Now, you can do this best by tying the characters both to the plot and to each other before the first scene. Every player at the table should know who their character is, why their character is invested in what's about to happen, and why they are with and care about the other characters at the table. Now, a one-shot is not the kind of place to determine your party dynamic. You shouldn't be starting off meeting at an inn and trying to figure out why you know each other. That should all be pre-established before the game even starts. Now, nudging players towards or away certain character types may also come into play here if you have knowledge of them, the players. Uh, while the known introvert, quiet player might truly want to experiment, break out of their doldrums, and be the bold, chatty hero. And that's to be encouraged. That's part of what's great about one-off con play. If they don't want that, make sure that they get a role su more suited to how they actually want to play. Don't force unwilling players into rules they may not be comfortable with because it will affect everyone at the table. So you know it's the most important day in the characters' lives. Make sure that's clear to the players. Now, this can be done with background written on the character sheets. Keep it brief. No making people read for 20 minutes at the start of your game. Uh, it could be a pregame discussion, or it could just be the first scene of the game brings out what's happening. The characters should make sense and be tied to the story that's about to evolve. I can't how many times down to a the bunch of pre-check that the use like a random character generator to make, and they have absolutely nothing to do with the plot. Don't do that. Don't put a ranger in the group that's about to spend the entire night in a city. Don't throw in a decker if the heist doesn't require hacking. Skip the bounty hunter unless their target's going to show up during that game. Yeah, your character sheets and intro are where you have a short time to get players hooked and make them buy into your world. Now, one next level trick, this is something I'm seeing more and more of that seems to have been growing with uh, the advent of modern storytelling games, is to source the table. Uh, make characters that would all theoretically be involved in the plot that's about to happen, but then ask the players why they think their characters would actually get involved. So why did you want to steal the original Kyber Crystal? What is Tiamat taken from you that you feel she needs to be killed? Why do you need to be rewarded with money so badly? Things like that get the players not only invested in the characters, but also ties them into the story and plot. You want to establish inter-party relationships at the start of the game, too. Now, this can be done with questions like, whose life did you save during the last adventure? Having the player pick another player or another character at the table. Or what item did Sean find that you're jealous of? Or who does the boss pay attention to you over you, and do you care? Well, this was something that existed loosely back in the day. With a lot of modern storytelling games, this is a much more vital aspect. Relationships can drive the story and the action even, which is both a boon and can be a bane of the modern DM if they aren't yes. prepared for that interaction and development. Not only the modern DM, but the modern player. Some players are not comfortable with this. So that is another secret. When you do source the table, make sure you have answers yourself. So if the person doesn't know, you can kind of lead them on, right? Like if you say, who's live, do you say during the last time? And they're like, oh, I don't know. And they, well, what do you think if it's Sean? And this is why. Be ready to fill that in, because especially some more traditional players aren't going to be used to this type of um, shared adventure building or shared world building. Now, just yesterday, 
tuned into the Mission Mark podcast. I don't even really a direct inspiration, but they did a fantastic show on these kinds of specific questions, what they call leading questions. Uh, this is going to be episode 370. If you want to check that out, I think by the time our show drops on Tuesday, that should be live. Now, during the last bit, I talked about doing things before the game starts. Now, people often call this, when they're talking about campaign games or home games, session zero. And People think of session zero as a standalone night. Like, let's all get together and do session zero. The next week, we'll start the game. But session zero doesn't have to be a standalone game session. It's something you should be doing before any game, even a one shot. These pre game conversations are especially vital with public play events. And I hope this will make it clear why. Because these are some things you should do before any role playing game starts, whether this is a campaign or a single session. You want to start off as the, the game moderator and explain what the game is about and make sure everyone at the table has bought into that. Now, I'm not saying give away your plot and say, here's going to be our whole adventure. I'm just talking about a high level review that says, hey, we're here. We're playing Shadowrun. We're going to be doing a heist. We're going against as technology and there's going to be some betrayal in the third scene. Is everyone cool with that? Something like that, right? Now, for a con game, there should have been some kind of con event right up, right? Like, you're going to have some kind of book that says, hey, show up and play Shadowrun. You're going to see this. For a public play event, there's usually something posted somewhere, right? A Facebook group saying the different games. But sometimes it's really hard to get information across. And someone might show up to your game with a completely different expectation and show up and go, oh, wait, we're doing a heist. Well, I actually thought we were going to be shooting a bunch of gangers. Um, maybe this game's not right for you. Yeah, it might even be safest to assume that the people will not grasp your concept before they sit down. Yeah. While Sheep Ducks in the MCU, <laughs> a superhero game about fast talking cigars and extremity webbing might make sense to you. Others wow. might not be as familiar with Howard the Duck and be expecting to play Iron Man instead of anthropomorphic ducks. Wow, really? You, you, Sean, if you run a con game, I think that's that's <laughs> going to have to be it. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I was inspired by Don. Do you remember the cheap ducks? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I remember. <laughs> Why do they want that. cheap ducks? Yeah, uh, this, uh, the cheap ducks reference I got. Yep. Uh, uh, the, the extremity webbing got me a little thrown off there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Uh, so one method of doing this pre-game conversation, this is something pretty modern, something pretty cool, and it's called CATS, C-A-T-S. Uh, this was created by uh, Patrick O'Leary, uh, there'll be a link to him in the show notes and his blog post. And he just suggests you discuss four things before any game session. And you want to get players to buy in on this. Now, the first one you're going to talk about is concept. That's basically what I already mentioned. You're going to pitch your game. What's it about? Your three-minute pitch, hopefully shorter, actually, at the con game. You want to do this as quick as possible. What's the pitch? Like, are you, are you blowing up the Death Star? Are you going on a raid? Are you trying to steal the largest block of ice you've ever seen in your entire life in a game all about water shortages? You're going to try to pitch that. What's it about? Next, you're going to talk about the aim. What are the players trying to accomplish? Now, this, for most RPGs, is pretty clear, but is there a win condition? Sometimes there are. Sometimes there's a win, sometimes there's a loss. But the other thing I mentioned here is if you're trying to tell a specific type of story, like, hey, this is going to be a heist game. Oh, hey, we're trying to do a buddy cop story. Or, hey, we're trying to do uh, a run and gun. We're just, or we're just going to go and slaughter as many orcs as we can. Which kind of sets us to our next one, which is tone. Have a quick conversation about this. Is this a serious game? Is it a comedy? Are you going to go gonzo? If it's a serious game, everyone should know that before the game starts. If you're trying to run a horror game, even in Paranoia, you want to let everyone know that, hey, we're playing Paranoia, but we're going to treat it as something creepy. And it's going to be horrific what the computer does to us. Like, we're thinking 1984 meets Paranoia here, not a gonzo game. And everyone... And again, you want to get consent here. You want everyone to buy in. Next is subject matter. Here's where you're going to explain what ideas may be explored during the gameplay. Uh, I mentioned this when I did the little quick little shadow run blurb there that, hey, in the third act, there's going to be some betrayal. Is there a chance that something's going to come up during the game that may make someone uncomfortable, that may impact their fun? The point of this is to sit down at a table and play a game and have fun together. You want to talk about any subject matter that could impact someone else's fun. You want to set any boundaries if needed. And here with boundaries, we could probably talk for another entire episode or two 
and both gain and lose some listeners in the process. Yeah, this is, you know what, the, this is a, a controversial topic, and it shouldn't be, to be honest, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the topic of subject matter and boundaries does lead me to safety tools. Tabletop gaming safety tools should always be used when playing with strangers. Personally, I also think you should be using them when you play with your friends and in your home game, but especially when playing with strangers. But again, as Sean mentioned, we're not going to dig into safety tools here. That's a completely different topic than many other people who are much better wordsmiths than me have covered. Um, tools I'm talking about, though, include the X card, lines and veils, uh, script change, the open door policy, and so on. Now, this was something I had no concept of as a player until I rejoined the world of modern cons recently. Uh, I admit I am wildly privileged. Uh, and those I played with generally were as well. But once I got over my old man, get off the lawn, gut reactions to the idea, they really do make a lot of sense. And I think some of our play back in the day would have benefited yeah. from some of these ideas, even if we couldn't have imagined that at the time. No, oh, I totally agree. There, There is stuff that should have been X-carded in some of our games, even more recent games that I've run. I just hadn't thought of it before. Because I got to say, even if you don't think your game is going to have potentially harmful content, if in your head you think potentially harmful contact is rape and torture, uh, you never know what might actually bother another player. Everyone at the table is there to have fun. And all of these tools aren't there to censor you or to ruin your game. They're there to facilitate fun. They are there to make your game open and welcoming to all. Now, that got a little too serious in my <laughs> mind. Like, yes, we should be talking about this, but it's not all grimdark, right? Like, the point of this pregame talk is to make sure of one thing. Everyone at the table is on the same page, sitting down to play the same game. Everyone knows what to expect, and any required boundaries are clearly communicated and understood. So it does sound like a lot of work when we talk about it all in a row like this and we itemize it, or if you look at it all written out, the entire process should only take you a 10 minutes or so, maybe 15. And I got to say, 10 minutes spent at the beginning of the session to make sure everyone is on board can save you a ton of heartaches later. You're going to be playing for probably two to four hours. Spending a few minutes is the least you can do to make sure the rest of the experience is the best it can be for all those who choose to be involved in it. Now, my final tip for tonight uh, is that for pub public play one shots, you should have characters that are, if not completely ready to play, nearly ready to play. And I personally prefer nearly ready to play. Now, we all know most people who play role playing games love character generation. They love rolling up their characters or spending their points or whatever that is. And Almost everyone I've met who plays RPGs has an aversion to pre-generated characters. But it's just not realistic to make fully-fledged characters for an entire group of people during a one-shot. And it's not just a time issue either, right? Like, look at my suggestions above. Most of them that we already talked about, uh, most of them aren't going to work if you don't have a pre-established group of characters with pre-established ties to the plot and pre-established relationships. Yeah. Now, I'll admit that this is less true for many modern storytelling games than it is for more classical game systems. But even in those modern systems, at least the general role is usually assigned, even if other aspects are left for the player or players to develop as a group. Right. Uh, it's true. There are some exceptions. I'll mention them in a little bit, especially Powered by the Apocalypse games. There are some games where you're going to make characters. But the thing is, you're trying to make it the most important day of a character's life right? How do you do that if you don't know who the characters are before the game starts? Like, there's some really fine improv DMs out there. I don't even know if any of them could take six characters making completely random characters that you have no idea what you're going to get when you first start it. It's going to be really dis difficult, too, doing the cats thing and discussing the aim of your game if you don't know who the participants are. It's going to be way easier to tie the characters to the plot if you're creating those characters at the same time you're creating the plot before the game starts. Yeah. Now, the less experienced GM will want to generally lean towards more complete characters for players. And then, as you grow more comfortable with your improvisational skills, you can dial it back some and allow players more freedom at the start, keeping in mind time requirements. Now, getting back to those mo more modern systems, there are some out there that highly encourage creating characters at the table from one-shots. And I gotta say, I'm not a huge fan of this 
in part. I don't mind creating part of a character at the table. Actually, I, I like that. I encourage that. Please leave some blanks on my character sheet for me to fill out or give me a few options to pick from to make the character my own. Like seriously, at a minimum nowadays, let me choose my name, gender, and pronouns, at least, if nothing else. Just don't sit your players down to a blank piece of paper and have them fill it out top to bottom. Yeah, as I mentioned before, roles here are important. The group dynamic should be pre-established so that you don't end up trying to defeat an alien menace with five healers or face mm -hmm. off against a plot of foreign intrigue with nothing but a group of tanks. Yeah, uh, again, you want the characters to tie to the plot. How, how are the foreign intrigue characters going to have the day of their lives fighting tanks? It just doesn't work. Like, even if you're running Powered by the Apocalypse, in my opinion, limit the playbooks so that they're the ones that fit the story you're going to be telling. Have some of the information picked out, right? Like Powered by the Apocalypse, most of the games have you circled stuff. Have some of it circled, just not everything. Um, start selecting moves, right? Like if you've got a bunch of starting moves to pick from, give the players two or three options, but pick the rest of them. If you're running a fate game, determine most, if not all, of the character's aspects. Like, I'd probably leave the high high concept open. Or if you have a really thematic game, that's the one I would fill out and leave the rest open. Uh, just make sure that the ones you put in tie to the game at hand. And also, just a little extra tip, make sure you have extra characters. Uh, one reason I do this is just in case I end up with extra players. Now, this is not something I expected when I first started running games in public play, but I would be running Dungeons and Dragons at Hugo and Munin, long gone game store. Um, and people would come in and be like, oh, what are you playing? I used to have extra characters sheets on hand and I'd hand them a character sheet. Well, why don't you sit down and learn? And I would have people join in during the game. And that, I swear, I have gotten more people into the hobby of role playing by doing that than anything else I've done as an ambassador for gaming. Literally having people, as they're watching me play, say, sit down at the table, here's a character sheet, don't worry, we'll teach you what to do. So that's one of the reasons I have extra characters. Plus, I also want the characters to not feel forced into taking a, a specific character. So if I have six players and six options, someone's probably going to get stuck with someone they don't want. Uh, so I'd like to have like six, like eight. I have a couple extra characters to pick from. Yeah. So this is a comfort level thing and better for more experienced GMs like Mo. As I mentioned before, you don't want to dilute the experience for some overloading the game with characters uh, as a new uh, GM. And you may not be prepared to have extra characters come in. And again, keep them, keep it all as the important, most important day in all their lives. Yes. Uh -oh. Fair enough. Yeah, the extra characters usually what I do like this was Dungeons and Dragons, right? I'd have a couple extra fighters. Right, you can always have a couple. I didn't have an extra magic user to sit on the side. I'd, I'd have a couple, you know, tanks, fighters, or an archer, or ranger, or something like that. Right? They were they were, they were the 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 extras because these new people who are, if, especially if it is a new player, you probably don't want to throw them into the most exciting day of their character's life for their first RPG experience, in in that way. Like if it's going around. So I gotta say, this is just some of my tips. These are my top that I could think of. Because, man, there is a lot more involved. But for the sake of time, because we try to keep this podcast down to an hour and a half, and when I wrote this up on a blog post, I didn't want people to be reading for hours and write a small book. I uh, just realized that we have not get, gotten into everything or even any, even close to everything for running a con game or a one-shot. Because like we didn't even talk about pacing, game length, making sure your game will fit in the time. We didn't talk about beat structure or dealing with things – just being in public, like not enough lighting or being in a loud room. Now, I got to say, if those are topics you are interested in hearing Sean and I talk about, let us know. Maybe we'll return to this in a later episode. All right. So back in the lobby now, uh, we're going to look at your thoughts on running a public RPG event. And the lobby has had quite a lot to say in here. I'd like to thank uh, Brian for joining us again for a awesome. change. Hardly ever see you around. It's always fantastic uh, when you do. Uh, yeah, again, people are saying things uh, like Brian mentions. Your pre-gen pre character has to be mechanically nearly ready to yes. play, but then left more of the narrative characteristics of the characters to the first phase of play. Um, Major Kayla has ones, a... Oh, sorry, go, go ahead. One of, the, one of the ones I really like I've seen a lot of in the modern games is the, the relationship web set up between the other characters. We kind of alluded to that. I really like the, hey, your character is mechanically done. And you're going to name your character. You're going to determine how they look. 
and you're going to have a little bit of background. You're going to each say that out loud, right? Like what your thing is. And then you're going to pick someone you hate. You're going to pick someone you like, whatever that mechanic is, right? So from Hydro Hackers, you pick someone you're tight with. You have a bunch of people you're cool with. And then there's someone you're putting up with. And just doing that little tie-in really ties things together. Uh, Major Kayla had a fantastic little story here. They played a game where no one had a magical weapon and the villain could only be damaged with a magical weapon. Yeah, see, it, <laughs> how, how, how is that exciting? Like, how is that the, that the well, memorable story? Now, to, you be fair, now to be fair, it is a memorable story because one of the players had a spell book they found and began beating the villain about the head <laughs> with okay. the magic spell book. So, you know what? It, de again, depending on the players and the GM, Things like that can evolve, yeah. but it's really better if you can try and plan things just a little bit better and give, give them a little more chance so they don't have to uh, dig in. Oh, too fair deeply. enough. Like I, I played enough con games that were the the three room dungeon, the the three fights with two RP role playing scenes in between. Like I've done them all, and and they're enjoyable enough. Like I I okay, I've had a couple bad experiences, but those aren't the ones where I come back to Windsor and I'm telling people like, oh my God, you should have played, you know, Hydro Hackers. We stole an airship and we did this thing. Like I alluded to the Hydro Hackers game, right? So Phil Vecchione was uh, from the Mr. Rick and Mark group, had a game where you're, it's a heist game. So in his game, water shortages are, it's a big thing. You can listen to Phil on an interview on the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. I'm sure Sean or someone can probably pull out the episode number talking about his game, but in it, Water's super scarce, right? It's all controlled by the big co corporation and stealing water is a big deal. And pure water only comes from the mines of Europa. So it gets like literally flowed in from space. And in this game, at first, he was going to have you like steal a liter of water, right? And then he's like, wait, this is a one shot. This should be the, the heist, the big heist, the biggest heist these people have ever seen. This should be the... So then it became a like block of ice that you stole, which is just like like billions of dollars worth of water. Right. And it's it just the the it, and it, when we started the adventure, right, we, we're playing it. We're like, well, a block like a how big, like six feet by four feet. I'm like, seriously, that much water. It is such an, an important part of it. Right. And the other lesson you learned is if you're a DM and you put an airship in your game, someone will want to hijack the airship. Uh, and uh, who do we have here? Uh, Boo RPG is mentioning he got put into a Starfinder game as a pilot, and the only book of the adventure that he got to play on was on a jungle planet the entire yeah. time. Like I said the bounty hunter, right? Uh, like you, you put out the the bounty hunter in Star Wars. If you have a bounty hunter, you're playing a Star Wars game, and it's a one shot. The bounty better show up, right? Or if you're the smuggler and you have a debt, the debt better get called in, right? Like that's that, that kind of background stuff shouldn't be background stuff during a one shot. And uh, Phil was on our uh, H2O with Phil Vecchione special episode. It wasn't actually in one of our numbered episodes. Oh, it wasn't a numbered episode. No, so was, you uh, can still find that in our backlog. There's a link absolutely. on the website. If you uh, it, was between, it was between episode and 13 and 14. So episode 13.5, I guess, or uh, uh, in, the, in the stream of uh, things. So to quote Boudet RPG, old advice from English professors, the story you're telling isn't the most interesting time in your character's lives. You should be telling that story, which is exactly our point. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, and she games is pointing out it's an airship. How can so you not right, right want now to we get, a, we get a whole bunch of people agreeing with us, basically. Are there any new tips we missed? Uh, I know Major Kayla is mentioning that uh, when she gets a new pregen, she always looks at the personalities and quirks, quirks before yeah. even bothering looking at the stacks, the stats. Yeah, I gotta admit, like I played D and D at a con game, but I still wouldn't say I played D and D Fifth Edition because I played a con game and it was a great game. I had a great time, but I don't know if I mechanically played D and D at all. <laughs> yep. Uh, and Boudet RPG is uh, just sort of pointing out the benefits of some of the safety tools we mentioned. Uh, he had, uh, or they had, two arachnophobes line out spiders, which he it's had open. planned on dumping spiders yeah. on the adventurers during the, the uh, during the event. And, you know, that's just one of those little things that, you yeah, know, you sure, sp spider. the spiders, but, you know, most people aren't, a lot of people may not be that sort of level of arachnophobe, and these people spoke up and, and gave him a chance. Yeah, and one of the examples I had heard is player shows up to a game, 
no one knows this happened. They start playing, and the character's father gets threatened, and the player breaks down. Well, it ended up two days before the person's father died. You don't show up to the table and say, hey, my dad died. Don't talk about dads, right? Like, it's yeah. one of those things. If, though, if you do a session zero and you sit down ahead of time, but that's an example of something that got X carded because the player wasn't thinking someone's going to threaten my character's dad. Like, that was the, they were there to forget about what had just happened in their life. And then all of a sudden, something came up. And that's where a tool like the X card is extremely valuable. And it's not censoring, right? It's, it's true. Uh, like I said, people, people more eloquent than I have said better things about it. I am not the the best wordsmith at times, but I think they are valuable to use. And like I said, especially in public play, when you don't know who you're playing with, you don't know what might upset them. And again, it's it's an, it's difficult for us as well because we went through so much of our role playing mm -hmm. life and development without those concepts. Yeah. Um. And so the people who have grown up with those ideas and those needs and those wants on the table. Uh, who weren't, you know, big white guys who, yeah. you know, didn't have necessarily have as many concerns or didn't care about the concerns because we were being our, you know, rep repressed white maleness, uh, <laughs> you know. And, and so there, there's a very different feeling for certain people and certain uh, groups of people and people who have grown up with those tools. Yes. And those are people I want to game with. And that's Absolutely. the point is now we want to open the table to everyone. All right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Boudet RPG mentions, it's valuable for as many people as possible to extol the virtues of safety mechanics because so many people in the hobby hand wave them out of privilege. And that's very, very true. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I kind of dismissed them early on and I've, I have grown past that to really see the benefit uh, for a lot of people, even if it's not something I meet, necessarily feel the need to use i feel the need to put them out there for those people who do need them mm -hmm. that and you never know when you're going to need them like, absolutely you really don't and the other thing too is the x card's not always about correcting tone sometimes you are playing a horror game and someone makes a bad mcdonald's joke in the middle of your horror game right when someone's about to be stabbed and it's like dude like that total like you just killed the whole scene right like yeah. it's not just about safety it's also about tone policing right or yep. tone policing is probably the wrong word tone watching tone again yeah. my words <laughs> all right i well, need to write it. this stuff ahead of time and then i can talk about it a little better all right well that's it for this week's ask the bellhop if you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on gaming advice if you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. If you want more RPG topics, that's how to get us to keep talking role-playing games as well as board games. Said so it's all about the tabletop. Yes, thank you, Boudet RPG Managing Tone. Tone management. All right. Well, I know why you shrank this time, at least, because I didn't change them on all the scenes, apparently. But, uh, oh, we there we go. But we didn't. Didn't do anything wrong last time. It worked last time. So, uh, all right. And I'm just going to bounce back and forward again. We keep growing with the support of fans like you. So if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, thumbs up, or share with your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Uh, sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email. basically recaps all the content we've released the week previous. Any blog posts, podcast episodes, reviews, giveaways, or anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletters.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. All right, this Saturday, August 24th, is our first stop on the road to Extra Life. All right, join us in person at the CG Realm at 1311 Tecumseh Road East, where we'll be gaming from 10 a.m. till 10 p.m. Or catch us online right here on Twitch, where we'll be streaming the entire event. For those of you listening to the podcast, that's at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. Actually, those of you listening to the podcast, you missed it. <laughs> but next time you'll catch us. And next time we stream. Which, speaking of which, the bellhop on Extra Light is going to be a level up event. Uh, this is a style event we've done in Windsor before. This is going to be a role-playing event 
It's going to hit on September 21st. Expect to hear more about that charity RPG event in the coming weeks. So have you checked out my Zentico review yet? No? Well, did you know that it includes a giveaway? Like, seriously, we're giving away one copy of the abstract strategy game Zentico. Now, this is a game I think is awesome for playing outdoors. Now, my copy is literally sitting out in the back of my van, and we break it out, like, on the weekends and stuff, right? Uh, we had it out in Leamington on the weekend. We were at a splash pad. Uh, we've had them out at the playground out by the Lighthouse Park after playing some ping pong. Deanna and I played. And we even had it down at Sandpoint Beach. Now, Zantico has agreed to give away one copy of their game to one lucky winner anywhere in the world. All you have to do is find the review at tabletopbellhop.com, find the link at the bottom of the review to enter. Uh, you can get entries for basically following our content on a variety of platforms, as well as checking out some of Zantico's social media. All you podcast listeners can actually get five bonus entries. All you got to do is enter the code rolled up R O L L E D U P into the raffle copter widget. All right. And for those of you here live in our chat room on Twitch, um, Oh, we lost it. <laughs> we, we don't have the, code. we will be putting it. another five entry code into the chat room. Once we discover what that is, but <laughs> stand by in the chat room. Now, the contest closes at midnight on September 5th, two weeks from the day we are recording this. Good luck. Right. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the table? Every week, we like to take this look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. Uh, so this past week, I hosted another game night at Easy Mode, which is an eSports lounge that opened up in the last couple months here in Windsor. Um, one of the things that I really like about Game at Easy Mode so far is that we are getting a lot of new gamers out. I think a big part of that is the fact that it's a video gaming lounge in general. Um, this has included ex experienced players, who I've never seen out at public play events before, as well as people who are completely new to hobby board gaming. And this past weekend, we had actually had a good mix of both. You know, it's been great to see this new venue with a different crowd growing and evolving to become a real solid part of the Windsor gaming landscape. I have a feeling that uh, Easy Mode is probably uh, a bit of a neutral territory where this way mm -hmm. people don't have to sort of uh, state their preference for one of the two gaming stores, uh, which also hold events. Yeah, plus it's not gaming at a store. One of the problems with gaming at a store is people feel obliged to spend money, right? Like, which I actually support. You should support the venue that's hosting you. But it's a heck of a lot easier when you can support them by buying a pawn of Walkerville beer instead of buying a $40 board game. Now, due to having so many new gamers show up at Easy Mode over the last couple of weeks, I've started bringing more and more gateway games to the event, which obviously ties in well with last week's episode where we were talking about modern gateway games. And most of what I brought, actually, last week, I kind of took the pile that I set up behind our uh, podcast here. I basically kind of scooped that up and brought it with me to Easy Mode. Now, I did bring one new one, though. This is something I managed to pick up at Origins, and I thought it would be a good gateway game for an event like this, and that is Tower of Madness. Uh, this is published by Smirk and Dagger Games, designed by Kurt Covert himself, who's the, also the owner of the company. Uh, it was released last year. Uh, I do remember seeing it at Origins, but I think the actual release to the public was Gen Con 2018. I did get a review copy off Kurt at Origins this past year, and I taught and played Tower of Madness a total of three times on Saturday. Now, I got to admit, when I first saw it at Origins, uh, it's a tower with a bunch of things stuck into it, and marbles put in the top. Yes, it's basically kerplunk. Like, that's literally what the power part of the game is. Now, when I saw it at Origins, I thought that was it. I was just like, what, you're going to pull tentacles and, and whoever gets the last marble wins or something? Or maybe the different marble marble colors matter? Uh, okay, I don't know. Looks kind of gimmicky, but sure. Um, I got to say, I'm very happy that it is much more than that. Um, to be honest, the tower is really a small but important part of the game. Because Tower of Madness is actually a push-your-luck dice game. 
And it's only when you fail in the dice rolling mechanic that you end up pulling tentacles from the tower and deal with any marbles that fall out. Well, it may be a small part of the game, but as we've said many times, that kind of table presence from a game aspect cannot be underestimated. Yeah, this one looks good. Uh, for those of you who do show up on, on the 24th, you'll get to see this one. It's definitely going to be out at Extra Light. Now, one of the things I did like about the game was I actually thought all the marbles were going to be horrible, and they're not, which actually kind of fits pretty well with the theme. Like, there are red madness marbles, and if you get four of those, you do go insane. And there are three green Cthulhu marbles, and if all of those come out, you do lose. But all the other ones are not only positive, but they're also more numerous. So you kind of want to pull, and you're avoiding madness. Like, it does really tie in. So for those following along, madness, bad, great old one, bad, other outcomes, good. Yeah, pretty much. That's that's every Cthulhu game in five minutes. <laughs> They're not even in five seconds. Um, I, I'm just impressed, really, that this is more of a gamer's game than than I expected. I, I thought it was going to be kind of a cheap gimmick, right? Uh, but at the same time, I am disappointed by a few things. For one, there's not a lot of tension from the tower. Like, it's kind of neat, but... We found that most of the time you pull and nothing happens. And then when we do get a marble to fall, like we'll get like one or two and then like six will fall at once, um, which is kind of weird. And the other thing that especially Deanna didn't like is when you pass on your investigation, you've supposedly succeeded. But the player who gets the points is the person who succeeded the best. So you passed, but you didn't get enough points. So you do nothing like you're just like, oh, I passed. Yeah. A yay. Like, you're almost better off failing because then you at least get to pull out a tentacle. Um, now, we have played three times, and no one's gone insane yet. Like, it hasn't even gotten close. No one's even gotten three marbles, let alone four. So, like, I haven't even gotten to experience that part of the game. Well, arguably, some gamers might... Uh, never mind. Uh... <laughs> uh, one other interesting thing that came up, too, is um, at the end of the night, Deanna's like, oh, we should sit down and try a two-player. And I'm like, all right, great. We'll sit down, try a two-player. And then I grab the rule book, and there's a number of starting spell cards you get. Or no, no, it's a number of locations. There's a number of locations you put in the location deck to explore uh, based on the number of players. And nowhere in there is two players. So I grabbed the box and looked, and sure enough, it says three to five players. Huh, that's kind of weird. So we, we tried it anyway. We're like, eh, we're here. Let's do it. And you know what? It worked. Like, it worked perfectly fine like there didn't seem to be any problem playing two players actually deanna preferred our two-player play to the earlier five-player play so i find it really odd that the game says plays three to five and i don't know why well i, I wouldn't have pegged this as a game for deanna in the first place so no. perhaps minimizing it down might just have been what the doctor ordered <laughs> maybe that's it now, as for other people's thoughts, because I did play with a, a couple different groups at the event, uh, the first game we played with all five players, I, literally everyone was like, eh, it's okay. Uh, one of the players specifically thought that this seems like a good game that didn't have enough play testing. Um, one of the complaints that came up too was not enough components to track everything, because sometimes you'd be doing the die rolls and it'd be like the first person to roll five of something, but there was no way to track five because you passed the dice. So that was a little weird. Um, I just, it went okay. Now, later in the night, I taught a second group, and it was a complete opposite. Like, the couple of the players playing this absolutely loved the game. Uh, one of them even had their phone out trying to see if they could buy a copy by the end of the night. So, okay. Two totally different views on it. And, well, the third play was the one with Deanna and I, and actually, that was quite fun. Uh, right now, though, I gotta say, uh, don't, I, don't rush out to buy this. Uh, but... I'm not going to talk anyone out of it. If you think it sounds cool, go for it. But like right now, I think this is a try before you buy. Well, and there's nothing wrong with that. So go out and talk to your local FLGS and see if they're interested and willing to run a demo night for the game. All right. Up next is uh, King of the Dice. So this is another game picked up at Origins 2019. Uh, this is one that's from Haba. And I picked it up to play with my girls, mainly my kids. Uh, I have played it with Big G. I played it with my oldest, and so far she's dug it. I haven't had a chance to play it with our youngest yet. She was uh, over visiting Grandma when we were playing. Uh, one of the things I was curious about with this game is if adults would actually enjoy it, something I wanted to check out before giving out the review. Now, I had a feeling it would be a great gateway game for non-hobby gamers, and I got to test that theory because I brought the game out on Saturday. 
So after we played Tower of Madness with that first group that kind of had a man experience, three of the five players moved to another table with me and I taught King of the Dice because I thought this would be amusing and tie in well because it's another push your luck dice game. So in King of the Dice, players are rolling a set of six dice, trying to match the patterns on various citizen cards that are laid out in the center of the table. Now, each citizen is worth points, and above each citizen is a territory card. Now, the citizens and the territories have colors, and if they happen to match, if they line up in the right place, you get to collect both cards. So there's a little bit of fore planning for that. Uh, the dice themselves are D6 is number one to six, but in addition to that, they also have colored sides. So there's red, green, and blue, and there is literally an equal number of each. So there's like two red ones and two blue ones and two green ones, and so on for all the other numbers. Now, the patterns required to take the citizens are all unique, and they include all kinds of different stuff. I'm not going to get into all of them, but like, uh, whatever, uh, all evens, all blues, uh, Yahtzee style, uh, a series, and so on. And some are more difficult to claim than others. No, it's a, so it's a simple game but there's enough complexity to make it available to a yeah. older player. You know, again, this is a family game that's really mm -hmm. open to a wide range of uh, players. Yeah, I totally agree. Because to me, King of the Dice, I don't know if anyone out there has heard of it, but probably have heard of the game Roll For It. Now, Roll For It is another dice game that is actually fairly similar to this, where you're going to put cards out and you're trying to get patterns on D6s. Now, Roll For It is literally marketed to adults. It's meant to be a party game. Whereas this game's marketed at families. Now, earlier I mentioned kids. I should be saying families because this is part of Haba's new game night game line. Um, and this is this was my first time playing it with only adults. There were no kids here. And I got to say, not only like it went over really well, not just well, like it went over really well. Uh, what I was surprised is people even dug the cartoony style of the game. Like it looks at Disney, I guess. Like Disney's not the right term, but it's 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 fantasy. It's 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 very they're very happy looking, right? Like these aren't these aren't mean looking creatures, trolls and orcs. Um, I remember at least one player was actually shocked by how good the game was. And all four of us that played agreed that the actual pusher luck dice mechanics, I gotta say, were better in this family game than Tower of Madness. I have to say it's the game is while it's a cartoon art style. The feeling of the characters reminds me almost of like a Pixar-ish okay. thing. Not not in not in style, but just in the, in that sort of emotional expression of the characters. It's 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 cute, but again, it's not kidsy cute. You know, it's not My Little Pony. Yeah, cute. yeah, it's uh, it's got a nice it's got a nice feel to it that way. Uh, and also, interestingly enough, uh, King of the Dice is actually rated uh, by the community as a higher starting age group than Roll for It. See, that's weird, because, well, they said, Roll for it's marketed at adults. Yeah. I play it with my kids. We own it. That's why we bought it. And uh, the reason I picked up King of the Dice was because my kids liked Roll for it, and I thought this was a better implementation of a very similar mechanic. Now, I only played King of the Dice once, but I left the game set up. Now, that's a t tip, right? If you're running public events, leave games set up. So when people walk in, they're like, oh, what's this? And then you can walk over and go, oh, you want to learn it? Leave a game set up. So I left the set up. Later in the night, uh, one of the players I taught, because this is how simple the game is, I noticed was teaching a full group of players who showed up later, which is awesome. And then I checked in with them. I'm like, hey, how'd it go? And everyone's like, oh, this is a really good game. I really like this game. And again, adults. Um, and yes, they serve adult beverages, but this wasn't like a big drinking thing. This this isn't a game where the alcohol is going to improve it or, or make it worse for that matter. This was like sober adults were enjoying the game. I got to say, I, I think uh, if I if things had happened in other words, this podcast had come before last week's podcast, King of the Dice totally would have been on my list of modern gateway games. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, it, in in some ways, one of the ways I feel like I might describe now, again, I haven't played this one yet, but uh, Yahtzee meets Card Kingdoms of Valeria is sort of the, the feel I, I get I uh, guess. seeing it. That's all. There's some good push or luck. There's some strategy to it. It's not just random. Now, I do have to admit, when I, I don't know if people remember it, but I have talked about this game before we played with Deanna, and Deanna was not a fan. She wants more control over her own destiny. She felt the game was too random. But it's a dice game, and it's a Yahtzee-based dice game. Like, it's it's a dice game with three rerolls. I, I just have a feeling she doesn't like, she hates roll for it. So I think that she might have thought it was slightly better. Now, speaking of Last week's topic in gateway games, one of the games we talked about last week was Lotus from Play Ren or from Renegade's game 
Studios. Um, I was talking about it last week, and I gotta say, like I said, I pretty much just took the pile we talked about last week and brought it to easy mode. Lotus was in that pile. Now, I did sit down and play it with four players, but this wasn't gateway game for those players. I was playing with established gamers. gamers. To be honest, it was Deanna, Tori, and Kat. So I'm not, I didn't get to if it was a good gateway game. Uh, but it was the first time playing for Deanna, Tori, and Kat. And I think it went over pretty well. The one issue, though, is kind of what I just alluded to a minute ago, is easy mode serves adult beverages. And one of the players may have been past the point of learning any new game at that point. Well, and this is a concern no matter what the game you play is. Folks, please, if you're going to be at public events, know your limits. Yeah, this, this wasn't bad. It didn't get to a bad place. But uh, you know what? We should have stopped the game because partway through the game, the person was like, you know, I should go home. And we should have just went, you know, let's wrap the game. That's actually my bad. Thinking, thinking about it in retrospect, we should have just ended it where we were. Um, I got to say, though, despite this, like we did play a full game and that player was just kind of checked out. I, it's still Lotus is good. Uh, I gotta admit, it had been a couple years since I played it, and since we and I recommended it on the episode, and I'm recommending it from nostalgia's sake. And it was nice to sit down and play it, and like talking about last week's what got me hyped about it, and it didn't disappoint. But now I do realize that when I was describing the scoring last week, wow, I was off. Um, well, I guess a bit off. I totally missed scoring when I talked about it last week. So just to correct what I said last week, so in Lotus you're building flowers. Each turn, you can play two petals, cycle the cards in your deck, or play a guardian, which are these cute little insect meeples. The various flowers each have a different number of petals, and I think there's five different types of flowers. Now, the way the scoring actually works is that when a flower is completed, the person who completes the flower, puts the last petal on, gets all the cards, and each of those is worth one point each. Now, the player who has area majority on that flower, which is based on their guardian marker, plus the card symbols that are on the cards when you play your cards, they have your color on them. They either get five points or get to get a special power. Now, there's three special powers. One lets you play three or more petals in a turn instead of two. Another lets you hold more cards, five, inst or five instead of four. And the last unlocks a special Elder Guardian, which is like a silver meeple, and it counts as two Guardians. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's one of those games where I think uh, it's a filler, so it doesn't need to be yeah. that super meaty. Uh, and people seem to just generally either like it if they like fillers or not like mm -hmm. it much. What I found interesting is the game has such a sort of singular artistic vision to it. And mm -hmm. yet when I look, it has two artists listed on the uh, on the box, which surprised the heck out of me because to, to find something that sort of singular in its design concept with two artists is... Uh, I'm going to guess one artist designed the back of the cards and the symbols. Like the iconography on the cards, and the other did the petals. Ah, uh, okay. That that's that that's a pure guess, but the, there are two distinct things going on, right? You've got the the mechanics on the cards, and then the art on the cards. Right. No, it makes sense. Now, except for the fact that we had one player who had a bit of difficulty grasping the nuances of the game, uh, our single play went well. Uh, I'm going to keep this one in rotation for a while. Um, Deanna is even saying in the chat right now, we should remember to the, bring this to the Extra Life event on Saturday, and I think it's great. I think this is the perfect weight and style of game for easy mode and for getting non-gamers to play or new gamers to play. Uh, it's got that thinky filler level. Like it, There's enough there that there's some meat. And it's quick to teach and light. And plus, everyone gets the the concept, right? You're building flowers. It's it's not a hard-to-approach theme. Yeah, no, I think the scoring is really the only thing that gets yeah, a, little a little wonky on it. But uh, the play, the gameplay itself up until that scoring point uh, is pretty straightforward. So that was all I played on Saturday. But, man, it, I wouldn't say it was packed, but it was our busiest night at Easy Mode yet and there were a ton of other games that got played and i wasn't sure if i wanted to talk about them or not but i did teach a bunch of games like one that i didn't play in was a four-player game of terraforming mars which was kind of funny so these four new people i've never seen before show up they walk over we have i talked about this before where you have a central table where all the games are available for people to play and they're looking at them and i was currently playing king of the dice and i'm like hey you gotta it's gotta excuse me i gotta go check in with these guys i gotta i gotta play host uh, there's another one of our tips is make sure you have a host at these events and don't expect to play games. And if you do tell the people you're playing with, you may need to take care of hosting. So I go over and I'm like, Hey, are these any games you guys want to play? And they're like, Oh, terraforming Mars. And I was just like, just for a second, like, I'm, I probably turned white. Right. I'm like, brand new gamers want to play terraforming Mars. Okay. I'm like, you guys, sorry, you people, do you realize, I don't remember what I actually said in person, try not to use guys, you folk. 
Do you, do you people realize that you pick the most complicated game on that table? Not that Terraforming Mars is hugely complicated, but for what I brought to easy mode, it was by far the most complicated game. You're like, oh, we know. And I'm like, oh, so you're familiar with Terraforming Mars? Like, oh, yeah, we watch Watch It Played videos. We've read the rule book. We just don't own it. We just want to check it out. I'm like, oh, okay, this I'm okay with. <laughs> so I sat them down. I helped them set up the game, and I taught them how to play, and it actually went really well. Uh, I It threw me off. Um, other games I saw played, uh, Modern Art by Rainier Nitzia, which is a game I've never played. It's one he's famous for, so that looked really good. Uh, Roger is a gentleman who just started coming out to events at CG Realm recently, and he's a local game designer. He's got a slew of games he's designed himself, and I saw him showing off a couple of his games. Uh, at the time, I was playing Tower or Tower of Madness, so I didn't get to try them. Uh, so that was cool to see. Uh, there was a group playing Elder Sign, which is Yati Cthulhu, which I thought was really funny after Tower of Madness, but that's a cooperative game. Um, I brought Sagrada and Go Cuckoo, and both of them got played at some point. I didn't teach them. People who I teach previously taught them, which I think Sean Hamilton might have taught both of them. No, Deanna taught Go Cuckoo. So there you go. Deanna taught a dexterity game. <laughs> um, so again, it's Go Cuckoo, everyone. I don't get it. I, everyone loves that game. Uh, Deanna tried out a game called Siberia that I got to say looks really good. She strongly recommended that as a really involved game that played in a very short amount of time. So like, there were a lot. It felt like a heavy Euro in a short space. So that sounds cool. Um, seems to be out of print, though. So I don't know if we'll be able to find a copy of that. Um, I even brought Zantico, right? Because I figured, hey, I'll show off the game and be like, hey, if you want to get a copy, you can go and enter the giveaway. And that got played by a group of three players. And I got to say, they seemed to like it. Roger in particular, the game designer guy, was really fascinated by the three-player game. Well, and three seems to be the sweep spot on that one. Yeah. I think we've kind of determined that uh, that's where it sits best. Yeah, I definitely agree. I, I'd almost say don't play it, too. <laughs> But overall, it was great. Uh, great event. We continue to get more people out each month. Uh, and I got to say, I love seeing the new faces. That To me, that's kind of what drives me. That's what kept me running things like the Windsor Gaming Resource and, and running events like this is seeing new people out every week. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What have you got planned for the coming week? Uh, well, uh, we're talking maybe a couple days from now, some three-player sorcerer streamed instead of Gloomhaven. Uh, of course, the Extra Life warm-up events on the 24th. Uh, so there's going to be all kinds of gaming. Uh, for those of you listening on Tuesday, it's already happened. Uh, but then it's literally three weeks until our next public play event, which just seems like a long time. But it's one of those, there's a fifth Saturday this month, like a fifth weekend. And then um, another local game store has an event the first Saturday of the month, and that's not one I attend. So I'm going to have a couple weekends free. So I think what I'm going to try to do is get some more of the games I brought home from Origins played. So expect to see some more unboxing videos. Well, you won't see them on YouTube, but like watch our Twitch channel. Watch your notifications because I, I got to get some more unboxings done. And I'm thinking of setting up some Saturday night events to play things like Vinhos or Pulsar, some of the bigger, heavier games that just I don't want to just show up to easy mode with and be like, hey, play this Vitalo Assorted game. You know, it's stuff that I, I basically event games. I need to schedule game nights. All right. Well, I still have some more expansions for DC that I haven't gotten around. And uh, I, again, I haven't gotten out to pick up that new one. So we'll, uh, We'll see. Maybe uh, maybe that'll be something I pick up on the 24th when I'm down. Yeah, very true. That that might work out. All right. And back in the lobby for the uh, final stop in. Uh, and she I think everyone went to bed. I think we did. We did definitely lose a, uh, a few folks. B uh, Brian and Boudet have both uh, headed off. Uh, possibly together, gotta... possibly not. We'll see. Yeah, uh, that was into that. I got to say, fantastic talk about safety tools in our chat tonight. Um, mm -hmm. I almost recommend that the people who are listening to this or watching this on YouTube go to Twitch and look at our previous videos just to watch the chat on this. Like There was some fantastic conversations going on between Boudet RPG and Brian Kurtz. Um, there's some great talk about why safety tools are important and how to implement them and talk about what has worked for people and how they have been a positive influence on people's games. Absolutely. I think uh, it, it's an important topic. It's not one we really wanted to delve too deeply into today, but the chat room had a really good run at it. Yeah, it was really good. <laughs> uh, Jeff is asking about the video, video on demand on YouTube. Yes. The unboxing, I record them on Twitch. So what I do is I sit down and I do them on Twitch. Cause why not? Right. I'm recording them anyway. Um, when I'm recording them, I don't interact with anyone in on on the chat i just open the box and you get to hear my thoughts live and that's what i want is i want that 
I want you to see me discover the sticky dice in Tower of Madness. <laughs> like that's that's the moment I want is I, and watch that unboxing video for Tower of Madness. You'll know what I'm talking about. I want people to see that initial impression, right? That that shock or that oh my god, look at this or the Ooh, what the heck is that, right? All of that. So I do it live. And then at the end of the actual unboxing, I'll ding the bell like normal, and then I'll interact with the chat, and I'll answer any questions people have. So I've had people say, like, oh, show me this card, or show me the art on this, or how big's the board, or are those made of wood or plastic, or so on. So then I can actually answer your questions about the product I'm unboxing. And then I send that to Sean, and then Sean edits it down to YouTube with the just bell to bell and none of the other extra stuff in it. Yeah. But yeah, they're all up there on YouTube. We just released Tower of Madness on Monday appropriately we're trying to tie them out oh there's deanna's linking to it yeah if, if we, we should almost like time stamp the sticky dice yeah. I, I was pretty creeped out by that i don't know how i kept streaming because it just kept creeping me out it's it's no an amusing disturbing. okay uh i'll save that for the after show yeah. okay you get to hear something disturbing about tower of madness in the after show All i'll right. save something positive too okay i i was going to save this for the next week uh so Kurt, the designer of the game, contacted me and have some fixes for the problems I found in the game. So big thumbs up for Kurt for actually reading my review. Like you can tell, he read it. And for critiquing how we played and giving us suggestions on how to improve the game. But I don't want to talk about that till we tried it. So that's right. why I was thinking I'd save it for next week. All right, we'll get to that another time then. And now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Brian Linscott Jr., thank you. Brian Kurtz, yeah, thanks for sticking with us, or you're missing this call out, Brian. <laughs> he, he stuck with us, but not quite long enough. Uh, Yuho Rutila, thank you. Uh, Yuho Rutila, thank you. Sean's getting color. Please. I am, I am. I got distracted by the shrinky video. Uh, shrinky video, oh, stupid. Yeah. I don't know. And again, I don't know, no, no. I, I think we're going to, I think next week we may have actually fixed it. This okay. week, it was because of the scene change issue. Yeah, I thought so. It's because of your scene changes. Yeah. All right. Yuho got two shout-outs. You're the, <laughs> the extra special Patreon. I think I think we answered a question last week was from Yuho, or two weeks ago. So, anyway, Graham Barnett, thank you. Evil John Carney, thanks. Am I doing this? Or you? That's you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Uh, if you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Uh, you can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30. We mostly play Gloomhaven, but now and then we'll surprise you with something else. Well, that about wraps up the time we have here for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For the Tabletop Be Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.